All right, thanks so much for being here today. My name is Lindsay Poisson. I'm from admissions, but this is a how we support our students session. Um, we have a few key leaders here who are here to answer your questions, and they'll each give a little bit of an introduction. Um, James Willett will be starting us off and also moderating this session. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot from him, um, but we'll start with our introductions and then move forward with the Q&A portion. James, do you mind taking it away? Great, thanks, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. James Willett, and I'm the Associate Vice President and Dean of Students here at Seattle University. Um, you know, before we get started, I just want to take an all, a moment to acknowledge the terrible tragedy that occurred this week in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and just say that all of us stand with our um, AAPI community uh, members and neighbors, and that we all stand against all acts of hate and violence. I know that this um, event is on a lot of people's minds this week, so we're all thinking of folks on the East Coast and everyone who's been impacted by this terrible event. Um, we're so happy that you've joined us this afternoon for this webinar to talk about how we support our students and how we live into our core value of caring for our students as whole persons during their time at Seattle U. Um, I would like to first congratulate you all uh, and your students on admission to Seattle U. This moment is an important milestone in your students' lives and we're privileged to be here to share part of it with you. I'm happy to be joined by several of my colleagues from key student services areas at Seattle U. In a few moments, they'll each introduce themselves and share a bit about their respective areas before we respond to your questions that you submitted when registering for today's webinar. And we hope to be able to answer all of them today. And we also have Lindsay, Nicole, and Tyler all helping to answer your questions in the chat box. So we will do everything we can to answer your questions. And of course, um, we can hang back for a couple of minutes at the end of the session if there's anything that you'd like to ask us offline. I'll also make sure to post some important links in the chat box and our email addresses in case anyone wants to send us any questions after the event. Um, before we get started, just make sure that your microphone is muted and um, we'll try to keep an eye on the chat box, but uh, sometimes the chats can get kind of long and we might lose sight of something. So feel free to repost something if we seem to miss it. So with that, we can, uh, we can get started. Um, I've had an opportunity to be, to be part of the SU community now since 2011. I started out working in housing and residence life as an area coordinator in the Murphy Apartments, and I now serve as Associate Vice President and Dean of Students here at SU. In my current leadership role, I oversee several student support areas of the university. They include housing and residence life, counseling and psychological services, um, our student health center, university recreation, and wellness health promotion. I also oversee student conduct at the university and chair the university's care team, uh, which is a team of campus experts who respond to referrals about students of concern from faculty, staff, and from student peers. And students of concern are those students who may need assistance overcoming a particular barrier to their success. It could be uh, physical or mental health concerns, access to food security, housing security, or other basic needs, um, or any other number of types of issues that can create a barrier for students. Ultimately, I just want you to know that I'm here for your student, like the colleagues that are here on this call today. I mean, we're all here to help you and your students navigate their college experience. So a big barrier we're all facing today is obviously the now year old COVID-19 crisis, which is, I think, always front of mind for all of us. Um, and certainly as we plan ahead for fall quarter 2021. Um, but as the infection rates continue to decline and vaccination rates continue to increase, I think we're all hopeful that we'll be able to resume in-person operations as much as possible in fall quarter. There are still a lot of unknowns at this point, but we have spent the last year adapting to quickly changing circumstances to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 on campus. Um, you know, compared to many universities, we've had a lot of success preventing outbreaks and keeping students safe, which I think is a testament to the hard work of our faculty and staff, um, but also to the commitment of our students for caring for and keeping one another safe and healthy. Um, we're often asked what some of the things are that we've done to try to mitigate the spread of COVID. Um, there's a lot of things that we learned this year and a lot of things that we put in place. Um, some of those measures included requiring all, our, all of our students to complete a COVID-19 prevention training course before uh, starting the quarter or starting the academic year. We required everyone on campus to wear face coverings at all times. We de-densified the residence halls and held most of our classes virtually. Uh, we required folks to check their symptoms and monitor for symptoms every day. We created a robust system for case investigation and contact tracing. We reserved space in the residence halls for isolation and quarantine. And we required all of our residential students and a sample of our commuter students to test for COVID each week. Now, which of these measures will remain in fall quarter remains to be determined. I imagine that we'll still have to have some mitigation efforts in place like uh, most other colleges and universities. 
Um, but we will continue to follow CDC guidelines and the guidelines of our local public health authorities um, to make sure that we can keep students safe and healthy while providing a robust and engaging student experience. Um, and uh, whether it's from admissions or other areas on campus, we will make sure to keep students and um, all of you family members and supporters up to date with any decisions about fall quarter and what our expectations will be for students as we all continue to, to combat this pandemic. One great resource for you all to know about is seattleu.edu slash coronavirus. The, if you go to the main Seattle U website, there's a link to this webpage right on top. And it's where you can find all of the up-to-date information about the university's planning in response to the pandemic. So with that, you know, one thing I would like to, to make sure that you all know about Seattle U that makes us distinctive from other universities is the extent to which we will care about your individual student. As a Jesuit Catholic University, our commitment to cure personalis, which is care for the whole person, is central to our efforts to support students at all times and particularly during the pandemic. Um, in a moment, you'll hear from some of my colleagues from key student support areas of the university, each of whom is also deeply committed to caring for and supporting your student during their time as a Red Hawk. We're committed to making sure that your student has a full, vibrant and meaningful experience transitioning to SU and then making sure that you feel reassured that we will provide all the care, support, and resources that they need to be successful with us. So with that, I'm gonna to transition to each of my colleagues to introduce their programs and services. As I said, we'll be glad to take your questions in the chat box. And with that, I'd like to welcome Tara Hicks, our director of the Student Health Center, Tara. Thank you, James. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon on a Sunday. Um, it's always great to be able to have an opportunity to share the services that we have. Um, my name is Tara Hicks. I am the director of the Student Health Center and I'm a nurse practitioner. I have been at Seattle University now for about 10 years. Um, some of the key ways that the Student Health Center supports students are through providing direct health care immunization management and compliance, resources for information about the student health insurance plan and the waiver process, and COVID surveillance testing. Um, to dive a little bit deeper into each of those, healthcare, the Student Health Center functions as a primary care clinic, um, and it is run by nurse practitioners. We have a combination of virtual and in-person visits with the nurse practitioner right now, which has worked really well. And I'm sure we'll continue some degree of the virtual visits into fall. Uh, students have access to many vaccines, including MMR, which is the measles vaccine, tetanus, hepatitis, and seasonally we offer the flu vaccine. We are in the process of applying for um, being able to receive the COVID vaccine as well. Uh, we provide COVID testing um, through several different routes. We work with two different labs, and we also have in-clinic rapid testing, um, testing for the PCR and antigen. Um, although there's a lot of health issues that can be managed by the Student Health Center, the one recommendation I do like to give parents and families is that if a student is seeing a specialist currently at home, I recommend establishing with a specialist here in Seattle as well. Um, and the Student Health Center has a list of uh, specialty providers that are within walking distance. And that's one of the great things about Seattle U also is we're located right in the middle of kind of the healthcare of Seattle. So there are healthcare providers, hospitals, pharmacies, all within an easy walking distance from campus. Now on the immunization compliance, the only requirement that we have right now is proof of immunity to measles. Um, that proof is generally through either two measles vaccines in the United States, it's the MMR vaccine or a blood test showing immunity. Um, we do still strongly recommend um, everyone being up to date with current rec recommended vaccines. Um, I give an extra push for meningitis B. It's not a required vaccine right now with, um, with pediatricians, but it's one to strongly consider before going to college. And then of course the COVID vaccine as soon as that's available to your student. Student health insurance. We have a student health plan um, that is available through Aetna Student Health. Aetna is a nationwide uh, insurance plan. So it's not something that's only usable at Seattle University or just in Seattle. Uh, there is a wide variety of providers across the United States and across the world that take Aetna. All undergraduate students are automatically enrolled in this plan, but have the option of waiving out if they have an insurance plan with comparable coverage. And a list of that comparable coverage is available on the Student Health Center website. Uh, 
we must receive an approved waiver by the deadline for the student to be removed from the Aetna Student Health Plan. And then last, I wanted to touch on COVID testing surveillance. Um, we have a surveillance testing program right now, and its primary function is to identify COVID activity early on campus. So before someone even has symptoms. Currently, we're testing resi residential students weekly with the PCR test, which is a gold standard COVID test. Um, our plan for surveillance testing in the fall will be based on what the science is telling us about transmission, as well as the level of COVID activity in the area and any requirements or recommendations of public health and Washington State. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, ne next, I'd like to introduce Lori Prince. Thank you, Tara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I see some familiar faces from our noon webinar on here, so it's good to have you back. My name is Lori Prince. I serve as the Director of Parent and Family Engagement, which means my office is actually here as a resource more for you um, as our family members and supporters of our current undergraduates. So my office is one that will send you a monthly newsletter about things happening on campus, uh, uh, any sort of special updated communications like we have done this past year about COVID, and, and how we're handling those things have come from my office as well. We sponsor some webinars for family members so you'll know about resources available to your student and how you can support your students in using those resources. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have our in-person family weekend in the fall, an opportunity for you to bring your student, visit your student on campus. My office coordinates that. Um, and I'm really kind of a, a first stop for you. If you don't know where to turn, if you have a question about something related to your student. I, am, I might not be able to answer it myself, but I am able to hopefully find the right resource for you. So when in doubt, I'm the one who you'll hopefully reach out to with a phone call um, or an email. So that'll be something that you can have access to regularly. We also have a family Facebook group of our, uh, Seattle U Parents and Families, and I, my office uh, monitors that as well. I'll put the link to that in the chat momentarily. So if you are a Facebooker and want to be in community with other uh, families of admitted SU students and current SU students, we would welcome you to join in there. But as I said, really, this is a big adventure for you as well as your student, and I'm here to support you. I'm also the parent of a Red Hawk alum. So I I work at the university, but I've been in the parent side of, of the university as well. Thanks so much. And I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Felisa. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Felisa Gadero. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist and I currently serve as the Associate Director for CAPS, which stands for Counseling and Psychological Services. I've been with CAPS since 2009 now um, and the Associate Director since 2012. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about our services. Um, the main services that we're offering at this time are counseling, referral, and consultation. And before I describe those uh, in more detail, I'll note that uh, CAPS is currently providing all services via telehealth. We use a HIPAA compliant confidential video platform, specifically Zoom for healthcare. Um, and at this time in Washington state and, and for many states across the country, uh, teletherapy is the primary modality for conducting psychotherapy appointments. Um, and then in terms of the pandemic, um, we are following CDC guidelines, as well as guidance from the American Psychological Association, the Washington State Department of Health, um, and King County Public Health, as it relates to safety measures for behavioral health care providers. Um, for therapy, uh, we're offering individual uh, short-term therapy. And uh, I saw a question in the chat earlier, I'll just answer it now, uh, to get started with services, uh, students can just contact our main number, which is on our website, um, and speak with our administrative assistant who will get them started with the process. Um, CAPS focuses on short-term therapy, uh, and so we see students um, not indefinitely and typically um, once every two weeks. Um, we are well suited for students whose goals are those that can be made good progress on uh, in about uh, a quarter's worth of time. Um, so either those goals get met or we can uh, make good progress on them. Uh, all of our clinicians are licensed providers in Washington State. Um, and um, I'll just note that uh, for teletherapy, um, the provider and the client or the student need to be in Washington State because that's where we're all licensed. 
Um, which brings me to referral. If you have a student who um, is going to be doing uh, remote programming of any kind, um, and we have students, of course, that are doing that now, um, our case manager is available to assist with finding referrals uh, in your state to help you find uh, licensed providers um, that your student can access. Um, and again, that service is also available by just contacting our front desk and uh, making the request with our administrative assistant. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of consultation, uh, CAP staff are available to consult with you. Um, oftentimes families have uh, questions about their uh, students' personal circumstances or history, um, and we're happy to um, talk with you individually to get those questions answered. Um, and then on our webpage um, are a number of COVID uh, related resources, um, as well as crisis numbers that are available 24 seven. I always like to mention those. Um, and then uh, all students right now, actually every, anybody with an SU email address has access to an app called Sanvelo, which is a self-help app um, designed to help manage uh, depression and anxiety and stress. Um, so that will also be available. All right, um, and now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Joelle Pretty. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome everyone. So happy to see all of your beautiful faces today. My name is Dr. Joelle Pretty, and I am the Assistant Provost for Student Academic Engagement. Um, I am also a double alum of Seattle U. Um, very proud to be a double Red Hawk um, and have been here, um, like many of my colleagues, since 2011. Uh, I oversee basically the areas that most people would associate with academic support for students. Um, I'm just gonna talk about five of those areas today because they really do apply to the majority of, of people that um, we work with coming in as fresh freshmen. Um, one of them is student academic persistence. Um, we really wanna help support students and I, and I know that you all had several questions about what are we doing um, with students who've taken gap years and, and concerns about maybe not continuing to keep up with the academics. Um, and student academic persistence is a great place to find those kinds of supports, especially around transitioning into Seattle University. There were also some questions about how involved faculty are. Um, and my area oversees our early alert program for academics. Um, we work very closely with James and the, the Dean of Students Office. Um, but if students are um, having difficulty with assignments or could use some extra academic support, faculty will submit an early alert and we will be able to reach out um, individually to students to make sure that they get connected with those resources. Uh, another area uh, that I also saw in the chat um, that I oversee is pre-major studies. Pre-major is a great place for students who are exploring, who may have an idea what they wanna study or what they wanna do career-wise, but aren't really sure um, how, what the major is that might be appropriate um, for that. Uh, that, that life choice. And so uh, pre-major advisors really work with students um, with hands-on activities, with advising sessions to really help them discern um, what is the correct direction for them at this time. Uh, I also oversee disability services. Um, many of your students will want to get in touch with them soon, at least over the summer, if, if not before. Um, to make sure that you're getting the proper documentation to the office so that they can help determine what appropriate accommodations will be. Um, it is definitely different than how you might have worked with um, students with disabilities from the high school setting. Um, it looks a lot different in college and so you'll want to get in touch with their office um, soon and make those connections. Um, probably the most direct support for academics for students is offered through our learning assistance programs. That offers what you would sort of assume um, a, a learning assistance program would offer. So we do have tutoring both one on one and in study groups. We offer um, conversation groups for support for um, languages. Um, but there's a couple of things that I want to point out because it is um, directly related to sort of this idea of, of can we can we give some academic coaching to students who may have been out of the, the school pipeline for a while. One is the Learning and Study Strategies Inventory. The acronym is LASSI, we call it the LASSI. Um, and it's a tool that I've used for decades actually with students. Um, and it's just a self sort of uh, evaluation about 
how you process, how you study, um, what your motivation is to be in school. And taking that can really help pinpoint some areas of both strength and challenge so that you can really lean on the areas that you're strong in, but also work on some strategies to develop the areas that are challenges. And then the other piece um, that learning assistance offers that I think is really underutilized are individual consultations. So students can sign up for an individual appointment with a learning specialist and talk about, this is what happened for me in, in high school, this is what I'm struggling with now, or even, um, and this is probably most common, frankly, for students at Seattle U, students who just want to get a jump on it, right, and just get into the, the groove of what is college life and what are the things that I need to know, um, talking to learning specialists about what they've seen um, as trip ups for students transitioning into college. I know time management is a big one that learning assistance works on. Um, and so really those two things, the LASI, the Le learning and study strategies inventory and the individual consultations through our learning assistance program are for everybody. And it doesn't have to be subject specific even though we do have tutoring available for several subjects. And then the last area I wanna talk about is undergraduate advising. So oversight for that area also falls within my portfolio. Um, at SU, we really want students to forge a strong connection with their advisor um, from as early as possible. Advisors get assigned to students in September and they will have a person. Um, we like to think of ourselves as kind of home base um, if you have questions about anything, you can start with us. And if we can't solve it or answer it, we know who to refer students to. Um, so really thinking about, as James was talking about, sort of the whole person. Advisors don't just want to talk to you about what, what kinds of classes you're taking, how the classes are going, what grades you're getting. We want to know how, how is it living with a roommate? Did you have a roommate? You know, did you have siblings that you lived with before? Or is this your first time? We want to know um, are you missing your siblings? What, you know, what was that relationship like? We really want to get a sense of you as a person, and that makes us better able to refer um, resources and opportunities to you um, as a student. Uh, so those are just a, a few of the areas that I oversee. Um, we'll look forward to taking more questions, and I want to toss it to my colleague, Tim Albert. Okay, so my name is Tim Albert. I'm Associate Director of Housing. Um, I'm also an alum uh, twice at Seattle University. So I think that probably puts me as the earliest uh, in our group starting at Seattle University in 1988. Um, oh, no, sorry, Lori, I forget. Lori was actually a resident director at the time I was a student. I, I uh, forgot about that part. Um, and all of my brothers went to Seattle University. And so for the parents out there, that's five boys. Um, total in our family. My parents are alive and well and uh, doing just fine. Uh, so, and my stepfather also taught at Seattle University for about 35 years. So anyway, a little bit about housing residence life. So kind of the three areas that we support the most, I mean, obviously housing, we provide housing for our residents. Um, and then we support students in a variety of different ways, um, particularly students in crisis um, or students who are struggling with various issues and then also community development. So a lot of what HRL provides, and that's what I'll call us HRL, Housing and Residence Life, um, we provide safe and convenient housing on campus along with kind of a built-in community, easy connections to campus services. We really do value creating space built around inclusivity and celebrating individual differences within our residential communities. And although each building and each community is unique, all provide opportunities to develop friendships, engage with the Seattle University community, and offer a variety of educational and community building um, events. So just a little bit about a few of the different things that you'll run into in housing. So housing does have uh, an on-campus requirement or the university has an on-campus requirement. And this is really built around that housing serves as really a gateway to connection, but also that students who live on campus overall tend to engage with their academics more, engage with their uh, other students more, they have that built-in community, and so they tend to do better. Um, we also have on-campus or staff 
on duty 24 seven to offer support to our students. So as part of that residential requirement for the first two years, so basically freshman and sophomore years, students are required to live on campus or they can also live at home. Those are their, their two primary, primary options. So let me talk a little bit about the staff that we have. So all our residence halls, including our apartments, um, have an area coordinator, an assistant area coordinator, residence assistants, desk assistants, Jesuits and residents and residential ministers. So let's talk first a little bit about the area coordinators. And this is in addition to our central office staff. So our area coordinators are our full-time staff. They have master's degrees, usually in university administration or counseling. They live on campus in the different communities that they oversee. Um, and then they supervise the staff and the services of that building. Assistant area coordinators are graduate students who are in our student development administration program. They work alongside with the area coordinators in managing a particular community and supervising the staff and delivering services to our students. Um, we also have the resident assistants or RAs, and they are student leaders who live on each floor or in each um, smaller community. They plan events. They build community, they talk with students about resources and delivering um, various services, they help mediate roommate conflicts. Um, they also provide some security and policy enforcement. Um, then we also have our desk staff. I mean, and they do a lot of the basic things like getting out supplies and keys and mails to students. Um, and then really one of the areas where we have some value added is our Jesuits and residents and resident ministers. They also live on the floors with students um, and they have the additional responsibilities um, or they have additional responsibilities elsewhere on campus. One of the resident ministers is an English uh, uh, faculty member. Another one works in campus ministry. We have another one who works in education abroad. Um, but their main role is to engage with students around spiritual and personal development issues. Um, they're great advocates for students. So these are the basic staff that we have in the residence halls. Um, so just my really quick one minute version of what do we, what residence halls we have. Uh, so for first year students, so incoming freshmen, we have Bellarmine, Campion, Xavier Hall. Those are our traditional residence halls. Um, and those are the ones with community restrooms. Um, you share a, one room with another student. Um, so that's for their first year. Uh, for their sophomore year, you have those three options along with Chardin, which is kind of sweets. Um, and then we also have the Yobi, although the Yobi, it's single rooms, will likely be offline next year to be used as isolation and quarantine space. Um, and then for junior and senior students, we have the Kolvenbach houses, which are a community engagement community um, in between the two fields. We have the Murphy apartments, Douglas Apartments and by Hilbert Apartments. So just a quick, what are the amenities? So all of our buildings come with a front desk, which has mail, packages, student information, equipment, keys. We have education centers, which uh, are 24 hour study areas in each residence halls. It also has computer lab, um, printing areas, things like that. We have common area kitchens, ethernet and wireless. Um, for the traditional halls, we have a micro fridge. So it's a combination microwave, refrigerator, freezer. In each building, we have laundry facilities. Um, and then I also wanna mention that we have a fantastic custodial and maintenance services on our campus. Um, so that's just a quick sort of roundup of housing. And so now I'm going to turn this back over to the group. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, the chat has been very active as, ex as expected with some pretty great questions. And I know that um, Lindsay and Nicole and Tyler have been trying to get, get to those. Um, we had an opportunity to review the questions that were submitted in advance and kind of gather those into different thematic areas. And so I'm going to pose a few of those to our um, to our presenters and we'll also continue to answer questions in the chat as we go. Um, the first question is back to Tim. Tim, uh, where do students hang out on the weekend and how do they build community? You're muted, Tim. Okay, sorry. So 
where do students hang out on the weekends? Where do they hang out? Uh, or how do they build community? So students hang out in a variety of places. On weekends, students often hang out mostly in and around campus, the residence halls, our various apartments. But some of the other big hubs tend to be the fitness center and SU Park. Um, even when the weather's not so great, a lot of students do really like to hang out on SU Park um, uh, to engage with other students and to uh, also participate in intramurals and different things like that. Um, we generally offer across kind of different departments several hundred programs um, throughout a quarter. So there's often a lot of different programs and different things happening on campus and games that students will uh, participate in um, with their friends. They often will hang out in their rooms, but they also tend to explore our neighborhood a lot. Um, and there's a lot of different restaurants and a lot of different things to do in our neighborhood. So a lot of students will do that. Many will also choose opportunities to go hiking, volunteer activities, um, or engage in many of the great restaurants and different things uh, on campus. Although this year, a lot of this has been a little bit more restricted and a little more difficult because of COVID. Um, but these are some of the kind of frequent places that people go and do um, on, on the weekends. Thanks, Tim. Um, the next question is for Joel. Um, there's been a couple of questions in the chat around tutoring. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about what learning assistance programs are available for students and how accessible are professors? Yeah, great questions. Um, our faculty at Seattle University are really here because they want to teach students, right? That's sort of the, their reason for being. Um, so faculty really want to get to know students they do pay attention to who's in class and who's not, and they will let us know if they haven't seen your student for a while. Um, and, and generally speaking, um, they really wanna be mentors um, for students at Seattle University and, and help, help them grow, not just um, in the, the academic areas, but also in professional development and um, you know, sort of holistic uh, formation. Um, again, our tutoring is amazing. We have one-on-one -on -one tutoring available. Sometimes there are small group tutoring is available. Um, primarily in the, the math and science area, as well as foreign language, um, we've sort of discovered which, uh, which subjects can be more challenging to students um, and, and try and tailor our offerings to that. Um, every quarter, there is what we call a scheduling blitz for, for tutoring. Um, which turns into a big event where students gather um, to do an intake to find out what their needs are and then get set up um, with a peer tutor. Um, that is not the only place that students can get connected. They can also just contact learning assistance programs um, when, they're, when they first open in the, um, in the term. And I just saw in the chat, yes, tutoring is not, there's no extra fee for tutoring. That is part of the tuition that you're paying for students. So. Um, again, we encourage students to access these learning assistance resources. Um, our students at Seattle University generally don't think of this as, um, you know, I, there's a stigma or I have a deficit. They think of it as, I know I can get a B on my own. I really want to get an A um, and, and really seeking out those extra support services. Thanks, Joel. Um, there have been a couple of questions about safety um, in the chat box. One earlier on around the protests and demonstrations last summer that were taking place in the neighborhood adjacent to campus. I and mean, another is just more sort of general safety questions. So I'm going to um, ask Tim a question about the residence halls and safety in a second. Um, but, you know, um, I was here um, last summer and I live very, very close to campus in the neighborhood where um, most of the demonstrations were occurring. And you know, there was a ample protest and demonstration activity last summer that went on for several weeks. Um, and I would say that campus was pretty minimally impacted by those demonstrations. There were maybe a couple of times where protesters who were dispersing spilled on the campus. That was at a time when there was really minimal activity on campus because we were primarily shut down because of the pandemic and uh, most classes were virtual and we don't normally have a lot of students on campus in the summer anyway. 
um, but there wasn't a lot of activity on campus related to those um, demonstrations. That being said, you know, we do have active students who, uh, many of whom participated in those demonstrations. Um, and, um, you know, one thing that I'll say for folks who aren't from the area um, is that, you know, I, I live in a place where I can look out and I can see um, the neighborhood where the protests were occurring. And sometimes I'd be watching the news and hearing the coverage of these things. And it would sound like, you know, it would sound like the apocalypse was happening and look out the window and be like, what are they talking about? So there, there's a big difference between actually living here and having experienced what occurred and then some of the coverage that occurred. That's not to say that there wasn't a lot of activity and that there were situations that for the people who were right in the heart of those demonstrations could have been dangerous. But I think that our students um, were, you know, unless they were there participating, they wouldn't have been impacted by that if they were on campus. Campus is open, it's not gated, it's open to the community. Um, but, you know, I walk my dog here every day. I feel very safe on campus. Um, somebody posted a link to our public safety department where you can find information about all the safety resources that are available to students. We have uniformed public safety officers who patrol campus. We have um, call boxes where people can push a button to get assistance from various parts of campus if they don't have their phone. Um, students really watch out for one another um, and keep an eye out for things that, that might be suspicious or dangerous and they report those things so that they can be addressed. We are in a city. Um, I think any student going to college in any city would need to be mindful of their surroundings. And we do offer programs during orientation to talk with students about you know, what does it mean to be a student living in an urban area? What do you need to do to like be street aware and kind of watch out for yourself? Um, and I think that, you know, with some of those basic skills and training, you know, most people are, are you know, are able to stay pretty safe. So um, if you're not from the area, I think that there can be an impression of the adjacent neighborhood that that might not be quite accurate. And so I'd be happy to talk with anybody offline about concerns about um, the city, but by and large, this is a very safe area. And um, while a greater level of awareness is always important for any student in a, in a city, um, you know, it's no uh, more or less dangerous than any other major city. Um, and with that, I wanted to ask Tim if you could comment on um, your perspective on how safe campus is and how do we keep our residence hall safe? Why don't I start off just by how do we keep our residence hall safe? So the first piece is residence halls are on card access 24 seven. That means you can't enter the building without using your ID card. Um, now we do have certain hours where any student can enter the residence halls and that's because we have offices for example, student health that is in um, Bellarmine and housing is in Campion. And so there are different buildings that host different services. Actually, Joelle's office is also in Bellarmine. So we want students during the regular office hours to be able to get to uh, access those services, but you still have to be an enrolled student for your card to be active during that time. In the evenings, you can only, only students who live in that particular building will have access to the entry of that building and then to go up into the residential areas. So that's beyond either a stairwell or, uh, or uh, the door to the stairs or to the elevators, your card will only be active for the, the building that you live in. So if you live off campus, you might be able to get into Bellarmine to uh, meet with Joelle's staff, but you won't be able to get up into the residential area, into the living sections of, of the residence halls. Um, so we do have that. Public safety also patrols the residence halls, so they don't just patrol campus. They are they do patrol that. And then in the evenings when the DAs are not sitting at the, the front desks, um, public safety comes in and monitors those areas um, and will monitor our, our lobbies um, at night. But we have public safety patrols going around. We have our desk staff along with the card access. And then in the evenings, the RAs also are checking out their community, looking for safety. Also, if there's any other student concerns or different things going on that they need to address. So that's a little bit about some of that that we do. We also offer um, self-defense programs through public safety, general safety programs, uh, particularly for students who might be coming from um, suburban or rural areas and they're not used to like, where do you need to be careful when you're walking around, you know, uh, uh, how to stay safe. Um, so we do have those programs that we, we have. And I will say, if there is an incident in and around campus, our public safety is very quick to respond. I mean, um, and often if there is some kind of 
incident happening in the city, even if it's not that close to campus. Public safety has the E2 campus system, uh, which is basically like a text alert system, and they will get alerts out to students to say, hey, something is happening in this neighborhood or that neighborhood, that's an area that you probably want to avoid during this time. So, and I'll also say, I, the whole summer I was working out of my office on campus. Um, and yeah, I kind of had the same impression as James that, you know, people, I would get calls from parents who were very worried about, oh, I, I see this or that. And I was like, it's not happening in and around our area. That's not to say nothing could happen, you know, and most of the protests that happened in the city were actually by and large peaceful. Um, but there are always small contingents that have some things, do some things, you know, um, uh, to often various vendors kind of a little farther away from our campus. It's often kind of a little bit more downtown um, where those things happen. Um, and, you know, again, our public safety does a great job. They patrol the campus um, and make sure students are alerted to anything that may uh, be happening. Um, you know, and during these times, I tend to check in with our RAs to see how are they feeling? How are things going? You know, uh, how are our staff or how are the students responding to things? And by and large, most of our students generally felt pretty safe um, when things were happening. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Lisa, question for you. How can I help my student prepare from transitioning out of this more isolated time uh, to living in community with other students? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think a number of students who have been in isolation um, for the past year or so, I think that's a very common question and one that we um, we have more and more, of course, COVID related uh, concerns uh, for our clients at CAPS. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier that all of our clinicians are generalists, which means they're um, uh, they're trained uh, to basically treat um, a variety of concerns. And, and for specialists like, um, for example, um, someone who would need um, like medical detox um, oversight um, for substance use or, uh, or pretty concerning substance use concerns or eating concerns, things like that we, we refer out for. So I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, but generally, um, our clinicians are, are able to treat most concerns uh, that present in our office. Um, so for transitioning, I would recommend um, doing a little bit of practice at home. So if there are, if your student has um, friends or other folks in their community that they can try to start, try to try to envision what college life um, might be like in terms of trying to make new friends, thinking about how you might approach someone, and what are the kinds of activities, I think this is a good question for, for you to have with your student, what kinds of activities and things are you comfortable with, or, or is your student comfortable with inviting someone to do, um, and, and what are the precautions or safety measures um, that you want to have that conversation with. So in the same way that I would say, um, you know, have a conversation with your student about finances, I think this is also a good conversation to have and, and to help them practice as much as possible while they're at home um, with thinking about things to do. I think speaking with other students who are current students at SU would be a, a really good resource in finding out what students do currently and how they've been creative in um, being able to connect um, I know that um, at another university, um, they had things like uh, each person on, on the floor was responsible for coming up with one activity for the floor to do, and it didn't cost any money or anything like that, but it was, um, you know, they would all uh, get on Zoom and do a drawing activity with uh, our cartoonist um, or something like that. And so there are ways that um, I think uh, students have been able to think about, okay, how can I take ownership for um, contributing and, and helping this community build, even though it's not being built in the same way that I might have envisioned. Um, and then the last thing I would mention um, is that is just to acknowledge that, you know, this is, this is not how any of us wanted this to go. And that's a huge understatement. Um, and so I think just for many of our um, you know, high school now juniors and seniors, um, or whoever were, were finishing up there as the, as the pandemic started to now as folks are coming into college, there's a lot of loss there for maybe missed graduation, missed 
celebration with family or friends. Um, so I think if there's ways that you can acknowledge that loss while also maybe finding some pieces of creativity for connection going forward in transitioning, um, those are some pieces that I would recommend. Thanks, Felisa. Let's see, um, Joelle, this question's for you. And uh, I'm gonna ask the question and sort of tack on my own follow-up. And it's probably something we could spend a whole hour talking about. So, um, so here it is. So the question was, um, are classes taught with a Christian worldview emphasis? So my follow-up to that would be, can you give us kind of the nickel tour of what it means for us to be a Jesuit university and how that kind of shows up in the curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are a liberal arts institution at heart. Um, and that means wrestling with some big complex ideas. Um, we do think that it's important for every student to have an understanding of um, Christianity, specifically Catholicism, as well as global religions, right? Because you can't open up a newspaper without uncovering some, some story that's happening in the world right now that has at its core um, faith and religious belief. Um, we do approach it from an academic point of view, however, not a conversion point of view. So we definitely want you to understand, you know, the history, um, even sometimes from a literature perspective of, of the Bible or the Quran. Um, we also want um, students to be able to, uh, to understand how these different faiths coincide and also um, conflict. Um, but nobody is trying to turn anybody else into a particular uh, way of thinking or belief system. Um, there are generally speaking um, two religion courses that are required in the core curriculum um, that students don't take until usually until the end of their freshman year or their sophomore year at the earliest. Um, so we want to give students a foundation of um, writing and critical thinking to be able to parse out um, what is true, what is what are multiple truths, particularly at the same time, what is paradox. Um, and so the, the topics that you're learning here um, are very much the same as, as you might learn someplace else, but with this really critical, um, how do we discern about particular challenging um, points of view that exist in, in our world today? And that's kind of the Jesuit approach is um, we're not trying to squash anybody's um, perspective, but we're trying to open it up um, and really have people be able to articulate what they think, articulate what they've learned, um, and wrestle with tough topics um, from a critical perspective. James, I can't wait to hear what you have to add. Not much to add. That was a pretty great way of, of collapsing a huge topic into about a two minute response. Well, I guess actually I would add that um, as I think about what we do outside of the classroom um, from a Jesuit Catholic perspective, I named this in my opening remarks, but you know, one of our core values is um, care, care of the whole person. And I think that we infuse that into everything that we do from a student support perspective. The other thing that I appreciate about working at a Jesuit Catholic university, and you know, I, I grew up Catholic, but I'm no longer a pra practicing Catholic. And I think about 33, 35% of our students identify as Catholic um, is that um, you don't have to be Catholic to appreciate the sort of Jesuit Catholic approach to education and the way that um, folks in our community want to tangle with the big tense questions. We look for the contradictions, we look for the things that um, might not make sense or might not fit um, and investigate them from an academic perspective. Um, and that's something that I've always really appreciated about working on this campus. Um, the other is our, you know, real commitment to diversity and social justice and how that's incorporated into the curriculum and how that's incorporated into our programs and services um, outside of the classroom. I think that we all work hard to create a, in, as, as inclusive a community as possible so that all of our students can find their place. Um, while also challenging some of the preconceived notions they come to campus with and to think about who they want to be um, in the world when they graduate from SU and go out and, and try to affect change. So um, I think it, it works for the curriculum, but we really try to think about what does this mean for our students and the ways that they're engaging with each other and with us outside of the classroom. 
All right, well, we've got time for a couple more questions. So I'm gonna ask Lori, um, especially as we're starting to transition back out of the pandemic and maybe getting back to some of the things we've missed in the last year, um, what are some of your favorite campus events and traditions that you're looking forward to experiencing again as we move into the next year? We don't have time for all of those. <laughs> I mean, we, we have a vibrant campus life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, for me, family weekend is one of them um, because it's a we, it's a chance for us to see you back with your student. Um, I would say things like uh, our Huyonani Hawaii Club sponsors an annual luau that I try to attend every year. It's about 500 people enjoying uh, food from the islands and culture and our students dancing. Um, the international student dinner, we, we do a lot of fun things around food, I'm not going to lie, when, uh, we, we enjoy uh, celebrating in community that way. I think um, we have an event from our wellness and health promotion called De-Stress with Dogs uh, around finals every quarter, which is fantastic. Literally hundreds of students come and just pet dogs for as long as we'll let them, faculty and staff bring their dogs. Um, so those are some of our, our fun events. I, and I think, you know, we do, um, we do a number of things around uh, the holidays and uh, an annual Christmas tree lighting. So those are a few of the things. And I would say even there are lots of small, like Tim mentioned the community development stuff in the halls. I think those opportunities for smaller group gatherings for our students are, are things I know they're missing right now and I hope we can get back to. Thanks, Lori. Um, let's see. One last question from the chat that I'll answer. One, somebody asked, can you speak to LGBTQI or the LGBTQI experience? And um, I can't speak to the experience of students, although I did write my dissertation about the experiences of gay male students on our campus. Um, but as an out gay staff member, um, there are many out faculty and staff on campus. And um, we have a pretty vibrant LGBTQ population on campus. Um, I think that our campus is very welcoming and safe. I think that, like I said before, in my answer around sort of Jesuit Catholic ethos, there are obvious tensions there, right? Um, but again, the thing that I appreciate about Jesuit Catholic higher ed is that we really um, investigate those questions. So what is that tension? What are those contradictions? And um, how can we acknowledge those contradictions and learn from them while still creating a safe an inclusive space for our students and for our community. So um, I would say that um, if, if your student identifies as LGBT or Q, um, then they will find community here at SU. And while you know we have a diverse community with many different worldviews and perspectives, and there may be tensions that arise, um, they will find community here on campus. Um, the last thing I'm gonna ask is one last question for Lori. What advice do you have for parents of incoming students to stay informed about news and events? Well, certainly, um, currently, uh, our Facebook page is a good place to do that. And we actually automatically enroll you in my monthly newsletter uh, if your student comes here, as long as we have your email address. And obviously, we do if you're here. Uh, that's how you found out about the event. So I would say that is a great way to do it. Um, and, and certainly, James, you mentioned the COVID uh, coronavirus site right now. Um, that is where multitudes of information just Everything we've done practically related to COVID is on that page and the most current information is there. Um, check in our website regularly, or if you just don't even, again, no, not, don't know where to go, please just email parents at seattleu.edu. I answer that email and I'm happy to try to dig it up for you and answer the, uh, you know, find the information you need. But the newsletter helps you stay in touch with what's happening, um, at least for students. I try to put things in there a bit ahead of time. so you will know some major event is coming up, like it's going to be advising week soon. Please you know, remind your student to make an appointment with their advisor or housing selection is coming up, those kinds of things. So you're in the know uh, about what things your student needs to be doing next. Thank you, Lori. Um, there was a quick question in there about whether or not we have gender inclusive housing and we do, and there's information about that on our website. And there's the link, thank you, Lindsay. 
Um, so with that, I've posted links to all of our um, offices and some of the things that we've referenced here today for your information. It's in the chat box. And I've also uh, pasted in the names and the um, email addresses of the presenters from today. And so if uh, you all have additional questions or concerns or anything you'd like to ask us about, we'd welcome you to reach out to us. With that, we are at uh, just about our time today. So we wanna thank you for joining us today and just wanna say again, how excited we are for your students and their admission to SU. We hope they'll be joining uh, us in the fall and that we'll have a chance to interact with you all again in, in some future webinars coming up. All right, thanks everybody. I also want to mention, we'll be sending out a recording. So if there's anything that you missed, you'll have a full recording. Lori and I will also be creating a document trying to condense some of these questions to get you information that you can reference at a later date. Um, as always, please feel free to reach out and thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday to connect. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and we're here to support you in any way we can. Have a great rest of your day.